Hello, uh, we have been discussing uh, interlaminar stresses and uh, in our last class we have actually understood the mechanics of uh, formation of interlaminar stresses at the free edges of laminate. Uh, starting from uh, equilibrium equations, we understood uh, how these interlaminar stresses are actually induced uh, at, a, at the free edge in a, in a very uh, small length over the free edge. And uh, we have also attributed the reasons for development of such interlaminar stresses, like we understood that uh, the three interlaminar stresses were tau xz, tau yz and sigma z, two interlaminar shear stresses and one interlaminar normal stress. Okay? And uh, we understood that uh, if we take a plus minus theta laminate, plus theta minus theta laminate subjected to only n x. Okay. We have seen in our last discussion that why uh, tau x z is actually induced because there is a gradient of tau x y near the free edge okay. and uh, because tau x y drops down to 0 at the free edge. Okay. So, now we understood the reason uh, the because of the property mismatch like suppose this is, this is the exploded view actually the plus theta and minus theta. Say this is plus theta and this is minus theta uh, together they are actually subjected to n x and it is perfectly bonded at the interface. Now, you will appreciate that if the plus theta layer is free and is subjected to n x, then it will actually uh, undergo shear deformation in the x y plane. Okay? That means, if the plus theta is left alone, suppose this is the plus theta layer subjected to n x. Okay? subjected to n x, then it will experience shear strain gamma x y. This is for plus theta. If the minus theta experiences n x, it will also experience shear strain, okay, but in the opposite direction. Okay. That means, gamma x y for plus theta is not equal to gamma x y minus theta okay, under n x, but then because they are perfectly bonded therefore, they are not allowed to undergo shear strain. Therefore, that shear strain is constant that leads to the development of interlaminar shear stress tau x z and the reason for this is what causes tau x y tau x uh, i mean what causes gamma x y the gamma x y n x causes gamma x y due to shear extension couplings okay similarly we also understood that if we take two adjacent layers one is 0, another is 90. One is 0, another is 90, okay. and both of them are actually subjected to n x. This is 0 degree, this is 90 degree, both of them are subjected to n x, they are perfectly bonded at their interface. Now, if the 0 degree layer is free and subjected to n x, subjected to n x, it will have transverse because of Poisson's effect, there will be transverse strain along y. Okay? Similarly, if the 90 degree layer 
is subjected to N x, it will also have transverse strain in the y direction. Okay. And these two are not equal. Okay. Therefore, epsilon y of 0 degree is not equal to epsilon y of 90 degree. The reason is Poisson's ratio nu x y for 0 degree is not equal to Poisson's ratio nu x y for 90 degree. However, they are perfectly bonded and they are not allowed to uh, undergo the same transverse strain which they would have experienced had they been free. Therefore, these two layers experience transverse stress sigma y. This leads to sigma y. Okay. Therefore, sigma y is because of the difference in Poisson's ratio. And as a result of sigma y, we know that leads to uh, uh, that leads to tau y z sorry. Therefore, that leads to tau y z not sigma y that leads to tau y z at the interface. Okay. That leads to tau y z at the interface and as a result of tau y z at the interface, we know that leads to sigma z. So, we understood uh, from the equilibrium equation, we understood why this uh, 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 interlaminar stress are developed at the free edge and we also attributed the reasons for that in terms of property mismatch of the adjacent layers. Okay. Now, uh, we need to know how to determine these stresses. Okay. Therefore, we will now see how to determine these stresses, determination of interlaminar stresses in laminates. Okay. We have already seen that uh, now this could be done analytically or these stresses could be determined numerically. Okay. Now, we have had, had some discussion about this analytical treatment already. Like if you remember for an n layer laminate, for an n layer laminate, we could write suppose this is an n layer laminate. Okay. This is interface 1 interface 2 like this, this is interface j. So, for an n layer laminate tau x z at an interface j was written as minus h by 2 to j okay. del tau x y del y dz. Okay. Similarly, tau y z at an interface is minus h by 2 del sigma y del y dz. Okay. This is z j. Okay. So, similarly sigma z at any interface is equal to minus h by 2 del tau y z del y d z. So, you could understand that at any interface if we need to know the interlaminar shear stress or normal stress, we must know how these stresses are varying. 
in the interlaminar uh, near the free edge. Okay. This this gradients. need to be known ok. So, depending upon how this uh, uh, if you remember that uh, we have shown at the free edge how these stresses vary. So, this is y, so this is the half width of the laminate B. So, this is how is the boundary layer which is approximately equal to the thickness of the laminate. Okay. Okay. So, this is tau x z similarly we have tau y z. Okay. We also have sigma z. Okay, this is at the free edge. So, in order to determine this, we need to know how tau x y varies in the boundary layer. How tau sigma y varies. So, if you remember that, this is how this is tau x y. Similarly, this is sigma y. Okay. Now, depending upon how this tau x y drops down from its full value to 0 at the free edge, we can determine tau x z. Say for example, for a simple case, for a simple linear variation of tau x z sorry tau y z. We can write suppose this is the tau y z variation suppose this is linear. Okay. So, we can write sorry linear variation of tau x x y sorry for a simple linear variation of tau x y in the boundary layer, we can write say tau x y prime is equal to 1 minus y 1 by h tau x y. That means, we define a coordinate in the boundary layer which is y 1. So, that uh, this is the boundary layer thickness near the free edge h. So, that y 1 varies between 0 to h. So, at uh, y 1 is equal to h tau x y prime is 0 at y 1 is equal to 0 tau x y prime is nothing but tau x y. Okay. Therefore, uh, we can replace del tau x y del y is nothing but del tau x y prime by del y 1 because there is no variation of tau x y other than the boundary layer region. Okay. So, in that case we can write tau x z at interface j is equal to minus h by 2 uh, del tau x y bar del y 1 d z. Okay. Now, suppose this is our equation number 1. So, this is equation number 2. Okay. Now, from equation 2 we can write del tau x y prime del y 1 is nothing but minus uh, tau x y by h. Okay, this is 3. Okay, therefore, we can write that tau x z at interface j. Now, we can replace this continuous integration by 
k is equal to 1 to j integration z k minus 1 to z k del tau x y prime by del y 1 d z. Okay. So, this is equal to minus k going from 1 to j. So, we can uh, take out this tau x y by h this is also minus and this integration z k minus 1 to z k d z. Therefore, tau x z at the j th interface is equal to 1 by h k going from 1 to j tau x y into t k t k is the signal z k minus 1 z k minus z k minus 1 is the t k. Okay. So, this is how for a simple linear variation therefore, for, for other variations also we could, but then we, we need to know the variation of tau x y in the boundary layer. Okay. Similarly, tau y z at z consider a linear variation of sigma y could be written as sigma y t k. Okay. Then uh, how to determine sigma z? For that you need to understand why the distribution of sigma z is like this. Okay. If you sigma z distributes itself like this, okay. it changes its sign. Suppose, this is positive, this is negative. The reason is, if you remember that at the free edge, because sigma y is equal to 0, at the free edge, sigma y is equal to 0, that leads to the development of at the free edge sigma y is equal to 0 led to the development of tau y z. This was our x, this was y, this was z. That led to the development of tau y z at the interface. But suppose if uh, that actually uh, a force equilibrium is all right, but if you look at that this sigma y Okay. and this is tau y z even though they balances each other, but then there is a net moment because of the sigma y suppose this is t. So, at this interface there is a unbalanced moment is equal to sigma y into t is the thickness of that particular layer into t by 2. Okay. Now, this moment is balanced by the distribution of sigma z. Okay. So, therefore, what happens is this is the unbalanced moment. Therefore, the sigma z distributes itself like this. So, as to balance this unbalanced moment. Okay. So, this balances the okay, sorry, this is the other way around. So, sigma z distributes itself like this, okay, which balances. Similarly, therefore, for suppose there are suppose there are n layers and we are interested to find in the jth layer jth interface what happens. Okay. So, we can find out at each of these what is sigma y, what is sigma y. 
Now, signs may be different, okay. I am just showing like this, okay. Therefore, the net moment at the jth interface will be sigma y into t for the first layer into this c 1. Similarly, because of this it is sigma 2 sorry sigma y into t for the second layer into c 2 this is c 2 like this okay. sigma y into t for the jth layer into c j. Therefore, the net moment is equal to sigma y t into c k going from 1 to j. So, this net moment must be equal to moment due to sigma z distribution. From there, we could find out what is sigma z. Therefore, uh, we can actually analytically uh, also determine, but we need to know the distribution. Therefore, we need to assume the distribution of sigma tau x y, sigma y and the sigma z distribution. Okay. You can also notice here that depending upon the sigma y, the sigma z distribution will be different. Therefore, if the sigma z distribution is such that near the free edge it is positive, then it will lead to delamination. If the near the free edge it is negative, then it is the, the effect is not as severe as uh, in the case of positive sigma z. Okay. But then uh, numerically it is uh, using, uh, so this is how we de uh, determine analytically and numerically we can use finite element method we can use finite element analysis to determine all the stress components in plane stresses sigma x, sigma y, tau x y and out of plane stresses uh, sigma z, tau x z, tau y z. Okay. However, there are issues uh, I mean you need to have proper mesh refinement and you need to choose uh, proper element to accurately determine the uh, stresses in the free edge. Okay. So, however, we can actually determine the uh, interlaminar stresses using numerical uh, methods like finite element analysis. Okay. Uh, then once we determine these stresses, once we determine the interlaminar stresses, are determined say using appropriate maybe numerical or analytical methods determined. What we do? We need to assess whether delamination will initiate. Because just uh, uh, due to the existence of interlaminar stresses, uh, whether delamination will initiate or not that is decided by what is the what are the interlaminar strength. Okay. Say for example, if we if at the free edge Suppose there is sigma z, it will try to open up okay, the, the edge, but then if the interlaminar normal strength is uh, sufficiently high compared to sigma z, then even though there is sigma z for a small value of sigma z, it may not be able to cause delamination. Okay. Similarly, for the other stresses also. Therefore, we need to understand whether delamination will initiate or not. Okay. Again, once a delamination initiates, whether the delamination we 
will grow or not. So, these two important questions need to be answered. Okay. Therefore, we need to have some criteria for delamination initiation as well as once a delamination initiate whether it propagates. Because suppose there is a delamination at the free edge. So, there is a small say so this is the interface. I am just showing half width of this. Say so this is half width of the laminate. Suppose there is a delamination already whose length is A. Now, subjected to loading whether this delamination will grow further or not that is important. Okay. Therefore, we need to have some criteria which will tell us that whether delamination will initiate and once it initiates whether that grows further or not. So, there are clearly two approaches for that. One is stress based approach, stress based approach, or mechanics of material approach, and fracture mechanics based approach. Fracture mechanics based approach. Okay. So, uh, in stress based approach uh, like uh, if you remember uh, in our macro mechanical analysis of lamina, we have discussed the development of strength failure theories, where we have actually considered uh, the lamina to be homogeneous. That means, a lamina is represented by its average properties okay, uh, both stiffness as well as strength and then uh, some strength theories have been developed based on those average uh, properties uh, deciding whether a lamina will fail, but those failure are mostly those failures are actually intra laminar failure okay. and that when we analyzed a laminate we could only uh, determine whether a ply fails or not. Okay these are intralaminar failure. However, um, uh, a laminate also fails because of the interlaminar stresses as we have discussed that even though uh, an individual lamina or two adjacent lamina may remain intact, but they may get separated at the interface leading to what is called delamination and that leads to a catastrophic failure of the laminate. Therefore, we need to understand both intralaminar and interlaminar uh, failure. So, we have discussed in details the intralaminar failure uh, even in the case of uh, uh, I mean uh, determination of progressive failure of laminate and now we discuss the criteria for uh, interlaminar failure like in stress based approach for uh, assessing whether delamination will initiate or not. Okay. So, in stress based approach we have average stress criterion which tells us that so this is okay this is sigma z this is half width of the laminate. This is not to scale okay? and this is the boundary layer region say okay, where the sigma z is developed. Now, if sigma z is the dominant mode, if sigma z is the dominant mode for delamination, okay, dominant stress, then sigma z average value of sigma z is calculated as
that means even though sigma j is very high at the free edge we calculate its average not the peak value over a small region near the uh, uh, near the free edge where b not is one ply thickness okay and if this sigma average value of sigma z is equal to the interlaminar normal strength interlaminar normal strength then this is the condition for delamination initiation okay this is average stress criterion which was put forward by kim and sony in 1984 okay However, uh, this is only for uh, when the delamination is dominant, dominated by sigma z or the interlaminar normal stress, but a more general criteria criterion for involving all the stress component, a more general criterion involving all the stress component is tau x z bar by s x z square plus tau y z bar by s y z square plus sigma z tension by s z plus square plus sigma z compression by S z minus square is equal to 1. This is the condition for delamination initiation. Okay where these are the corresponding strength. This is the interlaminar normal strength, interlaminar intention, interlaminar normal strength in compression okay. and this tau x z bar, tau y z bar and sigma z bar are nothing but the average value of this uh, we have already uh, discussed. Uh, tau x z tau y z sigma z dy okay where b naught is one ply thickness okay so uh, these are the uh, uh, stress based criterion for delamination initiation okay uh, and uh, we can actually determine that whether delamination will initiate at the free edge subjected to loading, but for that we need to calculate the stresses okay, at the free edge and we have already understood how to determine this uh, uh, stresses. Uh, we can actually uh, use uh, advanced numerical techniques like finite element analysis to determine the stresses and once we have those stresses we could actually uh, use uh, one, one of these criteria to actually assess whether delamination will grow or not. Now, uh, one thing about uh, uh, the delamination is that it leads to catastrophic failure, but it also when a delamination propagate delamination also leads to stiffness degradation. Delamination also leads to stiffness degradation. Which characterizes the delamination growth. Okay, uh, 
for example, suppose we have a laminate symmetric laminate say for example, if we have a symmetric laminate okay, if we have a symmetric laminate and it is intact there is no delamination okay it is a symmetric laminate with no delamination we have seen already that we can have an effective young's modulus okay we can have an effective we can determine the effective young's modulus of sorry this is x okay we can determine the effective young's modulus of a symmetric laminate effective Young's modulus in extension. Okay. What was that? If you remember this is A11 star where A11 star is the first element of the A inverse matrix okay. and H is the thickness of the laminate. Now, suppose this laminate is completely delaminated at a particular interface. That means, at a particular interface the bonding between bonding is completely lost. Therefore, it actually divides this laminate is equivalent to two sub laminates. Okay. Therefore, suppose uh, this laminate is completely delaminated. completely delaminated at a particular interface. Suppose at this interface it is completely delaminated because it is symmetric at both the interface. Okay. In that case the Young's modulus of the delaminated laminate will be equal to we can write this as summation of E x i into T i divided by h or which is summation of T i okay, where this is i is equal to 1 to m. Okay. That means, if the laminate is actually subdivided into m number of sub laminates, then we can determine the Young's modulus of this laminate as the weighted sum of each of these sub laminates. Okay. So, this is for the completely delaminated laminate. Okay. Uh, now, E x is the Young's modulus in extension for extension and Young's modulus for the intact laminate, and ED is when this completely delaminated. Now, for a partially delaminated, suppose we have say it is actually delaminated not over the entire width, but say over a length over A. So, naturally at uh, uh, a is equal to 0 it is E x at a is equal to b it is E d and in between for uh, partial delimited the value of E will be between E x and E d. Okay. Therefore, if we consider that E actually varies as a linear function of A that means E is equal to A plus B where A and B are constants. So, using uh, then we know that at A is equal to 0 E is equal to E x and at A is equal to B E is equal to E d. From this we can determine the values of A and B and we can write the expressions as E d minus E x A 
by b plus e x. So, this is for a partially delaminated laminate with a delamination with a the Young's modulus of that particular laminate. So, the stiffness degrades and depending upon how far the delamination has grown the stiffness degradation is related okay, and it, it could be characterized by the degradation of the stiffness. Okay. So, now we have understood the uh, stress based approach for stress based uh, stress based approach for delamination initiation criterion. Okay. Now, once there is a delamination whether that particular delamination will grow or not could be actually addressed using fracture mechanics approach. Now, many of you may not be uh, conversant with fracture mechanics approach. So, I will just briefly discuss the basic of fracture mechanics in very brief because the objective here is to understand that how fracture mechanics approach could be used for analysis of delamination. Okay. So, fracture mechanics approach is useful in analysis of laminated composites with cracks notches and for analysis of delamination. We will try to understand how delamination could be analyzed advantageously using fracture mechanics approach. Okay. So, fracture mechanics approach will not go into details of this, this itself is a uh, subject, but uh, it actually stems from Griffith's theory. Okay. And uh, Griffith actually reasoned that if you have a component suppose you have two components one is with a crack and one is without crack okay and he has reason that suppose this is a crack subjected to say the strain energy i think all of us know what is strain energy of the uncracked component is more than the strain energy of the cracked component okay or when a crack grows strain energy is released and that strain energy is actually utilized for generation of new surfaces say in this case suppose an elliptical crack therefore two new surfaces and uh, and for uh, uh, the surface energy associated with this generation of new surfaces are actually obtained from the strain energy. So, if the strain energy that is released is sufficient for the generation of two new, new surfaces then crack grows that is what the reasoning has been. Okay. In fracture in linear elastic fracture mechanics where we will only consider the linear elasticity uh, there are three modes of fracture three distinct modes. Suppose there is a say with respect to suppose there is a an edge crack like this or you may consider this to be a delamination at the interface. Okay. Now, this crack can actually if it is subjected to a load like this it can open up this is called the mode 1 or opening mode. Okay. Now, again with reference to your delamination what is this stress which is responsible for this opening mode 
this is sigma z. Okay. This may also slide okay. Okay. Now, this is the st stress. Okay. So, this is uh, say this is your tau y z okay. and suppose in our uh, in our case this is uh, x sorry not this is not x in our case this is y uh, this is uh, this is x this is y and this is z okay therefore this is y z so and it may also try to slide in the oppo in the other direction that means in the x x direction so tau x z okay so this may be this is called uh, mode 2 the sliding mode or this is called mode 3 this is shearing okay opening this is also shearing tau yz is in this in the, in the yz in in the in the z plane in y direction tau xz is z plane x direction okay so one is anti plane shearing another is this is anti plane shearing one is one is another is in plane shearing okay so three different modes are possible in case of fracture mechanics uh, okay so a, a when you have a crack here it may open in the mode 1 or it may try to slide over in the mode 2 or it may grow in the mode 3 okay uh, though this uh, fracture mechanics is actually uh, based on uh, linear uh, uh, sorry the uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic uh, material but uh, these are also used for heterogeneous and anisotropic material with proper modification so in fracture mechanics there are again two parameters which are extensively used stress intensity factor or in short SIF denoted by K strain energy release rate ACRR denoted by G. So, we have studied uh, the failure theories in mechanics of material approach. What we do? We find out the stress and compare that stress to corresponding strength, maybe independently or in some interactive following some interactive criterion. In fracture mechanics, however, the approach is that there is an existing flaw, there is an existing crack. Now, these parameters like stress intensity factor and strain energy release rates are actually used to assess whether that particular crack will grow under loading. We will just have a brief discussion on this. Now, the stress intensity factor actually requires determination of stresses determination of accurate stresses near the crack and for uh, anisotropic materials it is little more difficult mathematically okay and therefore uh, the strain energy release rate is widely used of course uh, stress intensity factor is also used nowadays uh, there are many ways to determine stress intensity factors for orthotropic uh, uh, heterogeneous materials and 
this strain energy release rate is uh, used as a parameter to assess whether a particular crack will grow or not. Therefore, we will restrict our discussions here to strain energy release rate with reference to how it could be applied to delamination growth. Okay. So, uh, let us uh, understand what is actually strain energy release rate. Okay. As we have discussed already that if the when a crack grows and strain energy is released. Okay. Now, if the strain energy released is at least equal to the energy associated with the new surfaces due to the crack growth, then the crack will grow. Okay. And to make it independent of the dimension of the crack, uh, it is the strain energy release rate. That means, energy released per unit area of the crack, even though it is rate, it is nothing to do with uh, uh, the, it is, it is actually uh, not time dependent. It is the strain energy per unit area of the crack growth. Say for example, uh, suppose we have a component which is loaded like this. Okay. Suppose it has a, this is pure mode 1, okay. the load is perpendicular to the plane of the crack. Okay. Suppose this is P and the corresponding displacement in the direction of P is U. Okay. So, as P increases, the corresponding displacement also increases. Okay. So, this is U and this is P. Okay. So, after some time as P keeps on increasing at some point of time the crack grows. As soon as there is a crack growth, then there is a load drop okay. and there is a corresponding increase in U. Okay. Suppose, this is delta U, this is a U and this is delta U and this is say delta P. And suppose this is actually P critical at which the, there is a crack growth. Okay. So, now uh, what is uh, the when the crack grows, when the crack grows initially this was the energy strain energy under this curve, when the crack grows this is the new strain energy. Okay. So, what is the strain energy released? The increase in potential energy is this much, suppose this is your G O A, suppose this is B, suppose this is C, this is D. Okay. So, increase in potential energy is this is delta W. Okay. This is say A B C D okay. and change in inter, uh, strain energy is this that is O A C this is delta U. Okay. Therefore, the strain energy release rate G is limit delta A tends to 0. Okay, delta A is the increase in crack area is delta W minus delta U divided by delta A. Okay. This could be written as, as delta A tends to 0, this is d W d A minus d U d A is equation number 1. Now, because it is mode 1, let us write this as G 1. Okay. Now, we can write the displacement u is equal to C into P, where C is the compliance of the system, okay. inverse of the stiffness. 
C is the compliance of the system is actually u by p because p by u is the stiffness okay and now the strain energy u is equal to half into p into u you know this the area under the stress strain curve okay or the area under stress strain curve multiplied by by the volume is the strain energy okay so half into load into displacement is the strain energy so this is equal to uh, half if we put u is equal to cp from 2 half uh, c p square this is equation number 3 okay half cp square therefore du da is equal to half c twice p dp da plus half p square dc da therefore du d a is equal to c p d p d a plus p square by 2 d c d a this is equation number 4. Okay. Now, what is delta w increase in potential is the delta w is actually now delta w is nothing but p into delta u okay therefore uh, limit delta a tends to zero delta w by delta a is equal to p into uh, du da Okay. that is equal to p into d d a of u is u we can put as c p therefore d w d a is equal to p into c d p d a plus p square d c d a okay this is your equation number 5 fine so now equation number 2 will give us now from equation number uh, 1 sorry therefore equation number 1 gives us g 1 is equal to d w d a d w d a is nothing but p c d p d a plus p square d c d a minus d u d a from 4 we can write c p d p d a minus p square by 2 d c d a therefore we can write g 1 is equal to p square by 2 d c d a what is d c d a rate of change of compliance with crack area okay we understand that as the crack area increases okay the compliance changes therefore we need to uh, find out what is d c d a okay so uh, uh, I mean suppose this is a throw the thickness crack suppose this is a through the thickness crack where this thickness is b therefore we can write this as q1 is equal to p square by twice b dc 
d a okay where a is the crack length and b is the uh, width of the uh, thickness of the uh, component where and the, this crack is through the thickness crack okay uh, now what we do this so now we can actually find out the energy release rate how therefore g1 could be determined as could be g1 could be determined as g1 could be determined by uh, calculating dc da how if we plot a versus c okay if we plot a versus c and we can find out what is dc da okay knowing dc da we can find out what is g1 okay uh, now the load at which the crack grows say it is p critical okay if we have the load deflection curve so when there is a crack growth it the load drops therefore we can find out what is p critical okay therefore corresponding g1 is called the g1 critical critical strain energy release rate so this is pcr p critical square divided by twice b dc da okay so we can find out what is the critical strain energy release rate and we can also determine g1 therefore if g1 is equal to g1c this is the condition for crack growth okay uh, there are uh, other issues also like uh, stable crack growth unstable crack growth i am not going into these details here but what uh, we can summarize is like this for a given crack we can find out what is the strain energy release rate and for that uh, uh, particular uh, material if we can determine what is the critical strain energy release rate okay if we can compare the energy strain energy release rate to the critical strain energy release rate we can actually assess whether that particular crack will grow or not okay so similarly here we have considered only a mode one similarly expressions for g2 and g3 could be obtained okay and then we can also determine the critical strain energy corresponding to mode 2 and mode 3 okay so coming to uh, how this could be applied uh, in the case of a delamination suppose we have an edge delamination okay suppose we have an edge delamination already i'm just showing half of this okay so this is b okay this is the laminate now this is our x this is our y sorry uh, this is our uh, z and this is our y uh, i think no no this is our this is of course this is y 
because delamination width and this is our x and this is our z. Okay. Now, suppose we have a delamination of length a. Now, what we need to do is we need to determine what is g 1. Suppose this is only dominated by sigma z. Okay. We can find out what is g 1 could be determined using numerical methods there are or analytical methods and then we can compare this with g 1 c. If g 1 is equal to g 1 c, we can say that this delamination will grow. If it is not, this delamination will not grow. That means, uh, given a, a component, suppose there is a delamination uh, already there, we can take a decision under that given load whether this delamination will grow further or it will be it will, it will not grow. Okay. So, how because we can calculate the strain energy release rate and compare that with the critical strain energy release rate and this critical strain energy release rate could actually be obtained uh, by uh, conducting experiments finding out the critical load and then determining determining the strain energy release rate. Okay. Uh, so, delamination at the interface actually grows along the interface therefore, it could be actually this fracture mechanics could be applied, but suppose we have a laminate where there is a crack like this. Suppose these are the fibers, suppose there is a transverse crack okay, subjected to this load. Now, what happens is in this case the crack grows and once it encounters a fiber, it cannot penetrate the fiber because now the strength of the fiber in the longitudinal direction is far higher compared to that of the matrix and therefore, what happens then this crack actually grows along the length of the fiber between the fiber and the matrix. Okay. Therefore, it is not that easy to assess crack growth in such cases. However, in the case of delamination because it, it grows along the interface this fracture mechanics approach could be uh, actually applied using strain energy release rate to take a decision whether the delamination grows or not. Thank you.